Praise the Lord. Um, quickly, um, I, in the last couple of weeks, the Lord's on my message, uh, on my heart to share about being in Christ. Everybody say, in Christ. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I shared a little bit of my testimony uh, a few weeks ago on our Community Sunday and uh, talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Do you guys have those verses back there? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, Therefore, therefore, if anyone... Somebody say, anyone. If anyone is in Christ, <laughs> the two greatest words in the Bible, in Christ. Amen. You could uh, quote the books of the Bible frontwards, and then you can quote them backwards. You can know all the uh, eschatology and the book of Revelation and Daniel and all the other stuff. You can know all the kings of Judah and Israel. You can know all the timeline of every patriarch. But if you don't know these two words, you don't know it, <laughs> okay? So if you want to reverse that and uh, just take it for this, start there. Start, if you're a new Christian or a struggling Christian in the beginning years of your Christianity or serving the Lord, start right there with those two words, in Christ, okay? The Genesis is good. Exodus all the way through to Malachi or, if you're Italian, Malachi, the Italian prophet, Malachi, <laughs> those are all good. Genesis through uh, Malachi. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that shows us the, 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 how Jesus came and all the powerful, you know, supernatural things, and then it showed how a son of God or a man anointed by the Spirit of God, the things he could do, he revealed to us the kingdom. Thank God for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right, where the, the gospel is consummated there. But from, uh, you see, Acts is the demonstrations of the Holy Ghost, and then you get into Romans. Everybody say Romans. Romans through Revelation are what we call epistles. Everybody say epistles. What does that mean? It means a letter. Everybody say a letter. What's an, a, 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 it was, these, these were letters written to churches, New Testament churches, or leaders of those churches, or the, the regions of where those churches are, like Galatians, Romans, amen, Ephesians. Then you have more letters like the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy, you know, different things like that. But those are letters written to the New Testament church. So Mark Hankin says it this way, the revelation that Jesus left the earth with because remember, he told his disciples, there's many things I, I, I need to say to you, want to say to you, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here. I'm going to do my part, get out of here, and then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going you know, to bring things back to your remembrance. But when Paul, I'm sorry, when Jesus ascended years after a, a man by the name of Saul, everybody say Saul, Saul who would later become Paul, uh, or like we call him, the Apostle Paul. Amen. The Apostle Paul says he was caught up into the uh, heavens. He didn't know whether he was in his body, out of his body. He didn't know. But he said he received revelations from Jesus, the head of the church. Is anybody here? He received revelation from Jesus, the head of the church. Is anybody here? It's not just some guy checking into the holiday Inn and saying, I'm going to write a few things down to churches and let them know how I'm doing. No, he received a revelation. He was caught up. He didn't know whether he's in his body or out of his body. And he's with Jesus, and Jesus is giving him the revelation of what actually happened in the death, burial, and resurrection uh, that he had gone through. Is anybody here? There's a revelation in there. So somebody said it this way. Uh, you can see what happened uh, to Jesus physically. How many have seen movies like The Passion of the Christ? Anybody? You know, we see those movies and we see physically what happened to Jesus. Everybody say physically. But how many know the importance really, the most important components of what Jesus accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection were not physical? Amen. So you can see what Jesus did in the Gospels physically, but in the epistles, we're given an x-ray. What does an x-ray do? You can see below just this, right? Is anybody here? That's what Jesus gave to Paul. He gave him an x-ray of what actually, is anybody here? 
Because I'm going to tell you what, this is powerful right here. This, is, this will be the most powerful thing that you hear all week. Amen. It's powerful. This is the x-ray, what happened below the surface, or in the spirit, we can say, through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Amen. So if any man is in, again, if any man is in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Uh, Kenneth Hagin said, if you were uh, short before you got saved, you're going to be short after you got saved. If you were tall, you're going to be tall. If you were ugly, you're still going to be ugly after you got saved. You might have a better glow about you, but you're going to, you know, all those other. Why? What is that saying? It's saying this outside change. Your inner man changed. Somebody say my inner man. Amen. Your inner man became a new creature. Somebody say new. new. My God, I wish somebody just listened today. Maybe you can actually let go of your past. I mean, who, what, what's the, where, where's Bobby? The guy, the boys were excited. They were telling me yesterday about the testimony. I mean, the, the kid was 16 years old, right? He murdered two people and got born again in prison. And he, he, you think at some point he had to, all the devastation that he had caused in his life, he had to realize, I'm a new creature. Like that, the person that committed those murders is dead and gone, right? I'm a new creature. That's what this is. It's a spiritual rebirth. I like what Lois Toucher said of Shekinah Glory. She said, if you don't like the way you were born, get born again. Folks, we don't believe the gospel. Some of you guys, you know what I used to hate? Going to like a testimony service or, you know, a meeting of some kind. And all, all the people get up and they get one gives their testimony and then the next one gives their testimony. And it's like, who could give the, the best testimony of how bad they were before they got saved? Oh, man, I, one guy will get up and say, oh, um, you know, I used to drink, uh, uh, you know, a 12-pack every day. Uh, you know, then the next guy's like, well, I drank uh, two bottles of whiskey every day. Huh? Well, then the next guy gets up, well, I, my God. By the end of that thing, you got... Uh, uh, the guy delivered 100 pounds of cocaine every week, you know? Everybody's trying to top the other person because they're still focused on who they were, not who they've become. Somebody say, in Christ. So I'm a new creature. I'm not connected to that nature that I used to be. Is anybody here? Somebody said, well, I still sin since I've become a new creature. Yeah, that's because you just haven't learned how to walk in or put on your new nature yet. Amen? You know, we could, we, uh, you, you know, some of you uh, guys, maybe your wife could lay out the best looking tuxedo suit to go out to a wedding or a dinner party, a, you know, higher class event kind of thing. And you can look at that thing and, you know, she laid that thing out because she wants you to put it on. But you can go out there and get them Wranglers and uh, crud kickers and big belt buckle. And, cow, and, you know, you can go out and, and nothing wrong with that, right? But the point is, she put the thing out for you. You had to put it on. God's put the new nature in you, and now he wants you to put it on and learn how to walk in it. Is anybody here? Somebody say, I'm a new creature. Hallelujah. All right, we talked about that. And then we Colossians 1.13. You can go back over these later on your own. Colossians 1.13, uh, it says, uh, the Father has delivered us. I think this is in the Amplified. The Father has, somebody say has, delivered us and drawn us to himself out of the control and the dominion of what? Darkness. There's two realms in the earth, darkness and light. You're operating in one or both of those realms. I'm talking about in your spiritual condition. If you're not born again, I don't care if you go to church every single day of your entire life. If you're not born again, you're in the kingdom of darkness. I've met pastors before that pastored for 25, 30 years, never been born again. How could you be a pastor? Hello? Maybe you just never heard the gospel. It's called religion, folks. He has. Somebody say has delivered us from the power of darkness or the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Somebody say amen. Last week we read Colossians. Oh, I'm on the wrong notes. I have a feeling here. Sorry about that. Here we go. I think I'm on, well, maybe not. All right. Colossians chapter one. What verse did I give you there? 
No. Well, see, you're not paying attention. I told you. I'm kidding. Just a couple more, ver- couple more verses down. No, 27, you're right. To them, God, this is what I talked about last week, to them God willed, pay attention, this is important. To them God willed to make known what are the riches, everybody say riches, what are the riches of the glory, the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which as uh, Laura said, that's us, right? The Gentiles, the non-Jew, those that have been now pulled into this thing, amen, because of what Jesus has done, the mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Which is, bless you, Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Somebody said the word uh, Christ. Everybody say Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. Say that with me. Say the anointed one and his anointing. Say it again. The anointed one and his anointing. So when you say Christ in you lives in where? In your spirit, man. The real you. In the real you, the anointed one, the Messiah, the anointed one, the risen Christ, lives in you. The anointed one and his anointing lives in you. Somebody say, he's in me now. The anointed one, the risen Savior of the world, the Messiah, the one that's been given all authority, is in you now. What's he doing in there? He's waiting on you to realize that he's in there so you'll let him out. Christ in you. So we looked at this word uh, last week, Christ, the anointed one of his anointing in you. The hope, everybody say the hope. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. Somebody said the word hope, the Bible definition of hope or the, 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 the meaning of the word is a confident expectation. A con- hope is a confident expectation. Uh, confident expectation, and then the word glory. This was I've been reading this verse for thir- 25 years, and um, I didn't I didn't I didn't catch this until a couple of weeks ago. But the word glory, I've heard people say it in and around it, but I, I didn't catch it in my spirit. But the word glory, everybody say glory. The word glory means full weight, full weight, or full expression. Full weight or full expression. Y'all hear? Full weight or full expression. So we saw the, the, con- the, the, the only confident expectation you and I have that God's full, the full weight of God, his full expression to be, re- be released through us. Let me say that again. Listen. The only hope we have to see the fullness of God released through us, or we could say it a different way. The only hope we have to see the fullness of God in manifestation, the only hope we have for that is summed up in one thing, Christ in you. It's the only hope that the world, it's the only hope that the world will actually experience the full weight and full expression of God. What, ha, what is that, what's the only hope for that to happen? Christ in you. Okay, let me say it a different way. The only way the world is gonna see God The only way the world is going to experience God's fullness, the only way, there's no other way. This is the plan of God. That's why it's so important. The only way the world's going to experience God's fullness is when you and I realize and and operate in Christ who's in us. That's the only hope. 
And this started dawning on me about 15 years or more ago when I started realizing our, our kind of church and Pentecostal churches and all, and all churches as far as that are like pursuing God. We're, we're in this, we're on this perpetual thing where we're praying for a move of God. Come on, folks. How many of you in here have prayed for a move of God? Yeah, but I mean, it's, this, this, this is it. The only move of God, the only move that God has is Christ in you. If, unless it dawns on the church, God ain't moving. He already made his move 2,000 years ago in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, his son. Now, the plan of God is now, it culminates in these two words, in Christ. So the only hope for the fullness of God to be in manifestation the only hope that the world around us, us, and they're going, they're going crazy out there, aren't they? They're losing it. Shelly was ministering a couple of weeks back about gross darkness. It's more than darkness, it's now a next level of darkness. Laura was reading this Rick Renner book about the flood, but before the Noah's flood, and how the New Testament, Jesus said, I believe, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. Well, what was going on in the days of Noah? The Bible says they, were, they, they couldn't have one righteous thought. Every thought they had was evil. Uh, there was all kind of stuff Rick Renner pointed out about watchmen that were angels that were coming down and sleeping with natural women, and they were producing these giants. It really happened, folks. It really happened. Like there was all kind of disgusting and terrible things that were happening. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the Son of Man returns. Meaning we're going to get back to that same level of evil that was in the days of Noah, that every single person, all they can think about constantly was evil. We're right on the edge of it. What's the answer? Christ, the only hope of the world seeing God is Christ in you. Which means if you don't take your place in Christ, then you are shortchanging the world from seeing the fullness of God. And I'm not just talking about you walking a little bit in Christ, because that doesn't work either. This is an all or nothing thing. You think you could just get in Christ and work a miracle and you're gonna get out here and get in the flesh? I mean, yes, of course we can do that with a free will, but for fullness to come, the full weight and expression of God to be released in and through us, we wanna be fully in Christ. Let, let me just help you all today. The way you're doing it, it, it ain't good. You think it's good. Some of you think some of what you're doing is good. And I'm not saying you're not a good person. You're not trying. But when we were operating below God's standard of what he called us to operate in, it's not good. It's not good. God's full plan is you and I walking and living in Christ. Is anybody here? Well, that was last week. That's why you don't need to stay home. I mean, good God, we're here once a week. Let's, get, let's go all in, you know? Well, we're here Monday, too. That's really good, Laura said. We need, to, we need to hear this. You're not getting this on Fox News, CNN, whatever poison you pick. You're not getting that on, uh, you know, whatever. This is why church is here. This is heaven's embassy here. We're preaching the God, the truth. Amen. Do you know how desperately the world needs you to realize that Christ is in you? We're ripping our generations off by continuing to come to church and be religious no matter how well-meaning we are. This, this is real simple. I read it in the message 
paraphrase last week. Paul said, the message paraphrase says, it's real basic. It's just Christ. That's it. The only thing you and I as believers need to focus on and operate in is Christ. That's it. If you want to simplify your life and be the most impactful people on the planet, step out of yourself and step into Christ and learn how to allow him to operate and flow through you. Now, that's going to have different expression for different callings and different people. Amen? Everybody's not going to be standing up here laying hands on people and do. You can do that out in your life. Amen? Whatever, whatever God's called you to do in Christ is what your contribution is. But when it all comes together as a body, God's fullness is there. There'll never be a shortage of finances. There'll never be a shortage of resources. There'll never be a shortage of healing. There'll never be a shortage of miracles. If every believer operates in their place in Christ, we would take over the world in a very short while. Why? Because we actually have all the power. We actually have the answer. You're out there in the world trying to work their kingdom and their, and it doesn't work. Those systems are, are failing and falling and coming to nothing. But in Christ, you're good. You're going to make it in Christ. You may not make it in you, but you can make it in, in Christ. Amen? All right, let's look at this. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Let's skip over to Romans chapter 5. Is anybody here? Good Lord. <laughs> Good Lord. Romans chapter 5. So we talked about being in Christ. Then we talked about the hope of glory again in Christ. Now look at this, week three, Romans chapter five. Everybody say, I'm listening. Romans chapter five, verse 17. It says in the New King James Version, for if by one man's offense, death reigned. Everybody say death. For if by one man's offense, one man's sin, one man's transgression, it's talking about Adam. Everybody say Adam. If through one man's offense, death reigned. Death is not physical death. It does produce physical death. Death here is talking about spiritual death, the realm of death. That's where sickness came from, poverty, fear, depression, all that's in the realm of death. That death reigned over mankind. Somebody say death reigned. Death reigned through the one much more. Amen. Amen. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Now, that's not just talking about life, like natural life, like in the time period called your life. That's, again, talking about the realm of life. Amen. The realm of or the, the what, did we, what did that other verse say? Uh, the dominion, he called us into the, king, the kingdom of life, right? The, the realm of life. That's the realm in which God operates. Hello? So because of Adam's sin, death reigned over all of us. But because of the, the other, Jesus, somebody say Jesus. Say it again. Because of what he did, now you and I have the opportunity to reign in the realm of life. Last time I checked, life triumphs over darkness. Life triumphs over darkness. Hello? So if you're going to pick a realm, you know, pick the, pick the right one. We've got to learn how to reign in the life realm. We, most, I'm not waving my hand at you, I'm just waving at the body of Christ in general. We, <laughs> which I guess includes all of us. <laughs> we got, Christians are just like the world. We're not reigning. We're not reigning. Look, look at this in the Amplified. Amplified says at the bottom of it, uh, reign as kings. See that at the top of there? 
those that are in Christ should be reigning like a king in life. Reigning as a king or queen, if you like. Reigning as a king or a queen in life, in the realm of life. So turn to your neighbor there and ask them, why are you struggling? Thank you, all three of you that did that. Why are you struggling? It's really not that complicated. It's not that complicated. We're struggling because we're still living in the realm of death. And we have not put on this new man and learned how to correctly walk in life. So we're still living in the residual of death. And, and that's, we do that mostly out of ignorance. And the devil helps because he blinds our, the minds of those who don't believe. Somebody say this with me just to, to release your faith. Say, I reign in life like a king. Husbands, you should turn around and tell that to your wife. I reign as a, as a king in life. I reign. I'm a king. Jesse Duplantis said, he says, I'm the king of this castle. He said, my wife told me I can say that. <laughs> you see in this verse, uh, there's two things here. Um, just for a few more minutes here. Can you take a little bit more? I don't want, thank you, uh, one hour, two hours. I don't want to bore you, you know. I know you have a lot of things to get to after this, uh, like football and Cheetos and Shasta root beer. <laughs> that's what my middle school, middle school football coach used to say. He said, that's the problem with y'all. You've been sitting around all summer drinking Shasta root beer and eating moon pies. <laughs> We have some busy stuff to do today, don't we? No, this is it. This is it. This is the highlight. Somebody say I'm listening. All right, there's two ingredients here for you and I to reign as a king. How many want to reign as a king? I mean, you, you really, truthfully, some of you just may want to continue on struggling. That's your decision. I mean, you can go ahead with your bad self. I don't, I mean, I do care and I do love you. I want you to reign in life, but everybody doesn't want to reign. I mean, you know. But for those of you, how many want to reign in life? Okay, we got, we're doing about 50, 60% maybe. The rest of you, there's plenty of other churches around that you can find. But we want to reign here. We're not, we don't want to play religious games. Somebody said, that's harsh. No, that's true. We're not here to play religious games. We're here to carry out the will of God effectively in the manner in which he gave it to us. You think we're supposed to be just walking around in failure and defeat? No, God put us in Christ. We're supposed to reign in life. So anything short of that is unacceptable. Amen. So if you want to play that religious game and just go on, you got your free ticket in the rapture, you just keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on doing, but you, you would have missed the plan of God for your life. Two ingredients here. Number one, the abundance of grace. Somebody say the abundance of grace. This is what it says in the verse, those who receive. I encourage you to write these down. They might help you later, you know. The, 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 the two ingredients to reigning in life are, number one, the abundance of grace, receiving. You've got to receive this. You can't just know about it. You have to receive it and apply it. The abundance of grace. Everybody say the abundance of grace. And number two, the gift of of righteousness, the gift of righteousness, amen. The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. If you're taking notes, you can write this down under the abundance of grace. I'm gonna I'm really, I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna preach this, it's so hard not to. Number one, grace is God's unmerited favor. God's unmerited favor. Number two, Grace is God's divine dealings with the human heart. Number two, God's 
grace is God's divine dealings. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you right now. I'm telling you, this will revolutionize the way that you do your life. Grace, number one, is God's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. Actually, you deserve the opposite, but he still gives you his favor. In abundance, unmerited, unlimited favor. Somebody say favor. Number two, God's divine dealings with the human heart. Does anybody uh, remember... You know, when you gave your heart to the Lord, you thought you might have you might have had a thought that would be the wrong thought that you had something to do with that encounter. Because you thought, oh, I need to go to church. I need to get my life together, right? You know. But that wasn't your thought. That was God's divine dealings with your heart. That was my experience a thousand times over. God's divine, if y'all want to reign kings, you might want to listen. God's divine dealings with your heart. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. Saved by grace. It is God's unmerited favor, but it's also God's divine dealings with our human heart. The same way you're saved, you can be healed the same way. You got to receive it as God's favor, God's goodness, God's kindness, and then you've got to allow God to deal with your heart and do what he, he's leading you to do. God's grace. And number three, God's ability. That's the definition of grace. That is the Bible definition of grace. God's unmerited favor, God's divine dealings with the human heart, and number three, God's Ability. We see in the Old Testament, I've been actually doing a little bit of meditating on the, old, the grace in the Old Testament, and um, it's powerful. Because you don't see Abraham, <coughs> you don't see Abraham struggling to find and follow God. And he wasn't even born again. Grace is actually more beautiful in the Old Testament, because we have our, all of our New Testament theology that it keeps grace from us because I'm in Christ, I have authority, I have faith. Yeah, but none of that works without grace. Abraham, all that he did for God, grace. God's unlimited, unmerited favor. God's favor, somebody say favor. Favor operating in, Abraham could not do all that God did it. God blessed him. She quoted it earlier. God blessed him. That was God's favor. God, Abraham had favor. And God was always dealing with Abraham. He'd stop and visit him. However, through angels or however, God was always dealing with his heart. Abraham, leave your, your, your mother and father's homeland here. Go to the place. God's dealing with him. And Abraham just goes, what is that, grace? And then you see God's ability in Abraham. 100-year-old men generally don't, uh, aren't successful at producing a child with a 90-year-old barren woman past the years of even bear, being able to bear a child. So God's ability was involved with Abraham. Same with Moses. Same with David. Now, these men weren't perfect. Grace does not require perfection on our part. Actually, grace allows some imperfection. It's kind of part of the grace formula. It's okay that you're not perfect, but God can still use you. Is that not the, the essence of grace? God, it's really God. The, the verse I had was, um, oh gosh, what was it? I think I left it out on accident. Uh, Philippians 2.13, I didn't give you that one, but it's not in your own strength in the Amplified this is one of my favorite verses on the subject of grace, Philippians 2.13, and you need to write it down, and you need to put it in front of you. You keep, let me tell you what, the Lord spoke to me a few years ago. He said, Darren, if you use one ounce, somebody needs to listen to this, because you're wearing yourself out, and you're going to burn out. You're not going to finish your course with joy. The Lord said to me, 
you are not, if you use one ounce of your own strength, you will not finish your course with joy. I'm talking about reigning in life. You can't reign in life operating in your own strength and ability. This is a yieldedness to the, that's why it says abundance of grace. So there's levels of grace. You can do a little, some people get in on the ground floor, little grace, just enough to get born again. But then they don't, they don't realize that's the way we live in this kingdom is by the grace of God. Meaning he's already opened the doors. He's already released his favor and kindness and goodness. We need to be looking for that, accepting it, acknowledging it. Then we need to allow, when he's dealing with our heart, we need to yield to that. And then when we yield to that and take a step of faith, then his ability comes upon us to actually fulfill what he told us to do. We can't, folks, we are so worldly minded. I'm telling you, the spirit of God's been saying for years now that there's individuals that he's calling to this body that are called to step out into the business arena and generate finances for kingdom building. But people automatically go to their natural brain and their natural reasoning and say, I can't afford that. And let me tell you how else this really crushes us. When you make plans that are based on your ability, they're always going to be smaller than what God would do if you relied on his ability. That's, that's, this is grace. So then we say, oh, I can't get a loan for this. Oh, this, this, oh, this, I can't leave my job. Oh, I can't. We're all the time, us, 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 us. Abraham didn't, he, yes, he probably had these moments, but he, yeah, he did. He tried to do it in his flesh. That's why we have the challenges we have now in the Middle East, right? We got, they're, they're, them two are gonna be, they've been against each other since Isaac came out of the womb, Isaac and Ishmael. Abraham tried to do it in his own ability, but he didn't do it the way God said it. He tried to perform it on his own. Hello? So then he got Ishmael by sleeping with his wife's maid. And you see how that kind of worked out. Hello? And then God said to Abraham years later, he said, I didn't ask for your help. I just need you to do what I told you to do. Your wife, Sarah, is going to have a child. Finally, they got it. And then he just let God be God and let God, perf let God perform it. I say this, and I like it. The Lord gave it to me. If what you're doing doesn't require God's help, you haven't yet found God's plan. And you know what we have across the body of Christ? We have saved people that are performing in their own ability. And it's not impressive. It's not impressive. What's gonna impress the world is when you and I actually allow God to do things through us that we could not do without him. That should be, by definition, what a Christian is. It's a person that has simply allowed Jesus to live through them. Somebody say, that's what a Christian is. A Christian is not someone, see, we have this version of Christianity that says, I've been saved. You know, when you, you got to say it in that uh, religious voice. Thank God. You know, you got to extend that O. you got to put that little thing on the line of a, God. God has saved me. Yes, Lord. We go through this whole thing, and we, we, we're, we're, I don't even know what I was saying about that, but um, I was listening to my own thing, like, God. I'm like, you sound like an idiot, boy. Be quiet. <laughs> We, 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 we say like, like God saved us and put us in this thing, but we hadn't yet yielded to actually God's ability operating through us. Is anybody here? Some, see, let me give you a little hope here right now. God wants to use every single person that is in this room. Every single one. Everybody watching online, God wants to use you. God wants you to reign in life as a king. 
He, he gave his son for that end. For what? Oh, that's what I was going to say. The, the, the church world, they'll say, yes, the blood of Jesus has washed my sins away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What'd you learn at church today? I learned my vows. Oh, yeah. You. No, we all say Jesus' blood has cleansed us, and we'd be right in saying that. But what we don't say, yes, Jesus has forgiven my sins. They had forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament. Their sins were forgiven in the Old Testament. Not permanently, but they were forgiven. We needed a little bit more than just forgiveness of sins. We needed a new nature. Somebody was saying to me the other day, um, well, I don't think that Jesus' righteousness is actually imputed to the Christian when they become saved. I'm not really, I don't think that's what the Bible means when it says we're in Christ. I said, that's exactly what the Bible means when it says I'm in Christ. Is anybody here? All right, let me give you the second one here. Grace. Somebody say grace. Look at this. It says through the abundance of grace, you receive. You, this just doesn't work automatically. You have to receive it by faith and allow it to operate. Hello? Somebody say, I have to receive it. You have to receive the grace of God. And you can receive a little bit of it or you can receive a lot of it. But those that receive the abundance of grace and then this, the gift of righteousness, those are the ones that reign in life. I'm going to another level. I'm going to another level. I'm going to another level. Somebody said it's it's that somebody you said years ago it's lonely it's mighty lonely at the top. That's because nobody they 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 maybe people are comfortable being lower. You know they don't want to leave. They don't want to like leave the level they're on, but God wants you to leave the level you're on. He wants you to reign in his life. Matter of fact, if you're not reigning in life, you you're actually living below what Jesus died for. Okay, the gift of righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm rounding, getting around third base here. We're gonna go get it, get it shut down here. Okay. All right. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. So we have the abundance of grace, and now we have the gift. Everybody say gift. The gift of righteousness. Gift. Of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Listen to this and the Amplified translation. Is anybody here? I'm sorry, I was just trying to give you a, a faith and victory. Is that okay? Does anybody want some faith and victory? You know, we've, got, we've had enough of, of like uh, doubt and uh, destruction. We need some faith and victory. The world needs some faith and victory. Where's my organ when I need it? I need some faith and victory. Well, ha, e, ha. I ain't making fun. I could preach like that. I could preach like that. Verse 20. So we are, somebody say that means me. We are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. God making his appeal. Y'all hang in there just for a minute or two here, okay? Making his appeal as it were through us. As Christ's personal representative, we beg you for his sake. We beg you, the Apostle Paul said, we beg you. We beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor. Lay hold on this, Paul said. Don't miss this. Lay hold on the divine favor now offered to you and be reconciled to God. For our sake... Somebody say, that means me. For our sake, he made Christ virtually to be sin who knew no sin. That says he took our sin nature and put it on Jesus who had never sinned, did not have a sin nature because he was not born of Adam, he was born of God. That's 
Somebody will get a revelation. That's why Mary was a virgin. There's a whole big reason for that. And it wasn't just for the forgiveness of sins. Mary was a virgin because if Jesus came from Joseph, he'd be just another one of you and I. Jesus was born of God, which means his spirit was righteous. Hello? Which means he now could become the sacrifice. He could be, you can't make someone sin that's already sinned. Jesus was righteous. He blamelessly kept the Jewish law without fault, born of God. Then God took our sin nature and put it on his son. Jesus' perfect righteous nature and our sin nature became one, which means Jesus became sin. Never sin, but became sin. Hello? Became that. Became that. Remember, he was on the cross. He would, up to that point, he said, Father, my Father, Father. Jesus, Jesus referred to God as Father. And then on the cross, when he was made to be sin, he cried out, my God, my God. Why? Because he was not connected to Father anymore. He became what you and I were. This is the x-ray that Paul received. Jesus was separated from God, just like you and I were. And he was united with us in that process. That's how we're able to receive it. Not because we go to church and we say a prayer and we're, well, our sins are forgiven. The gospel's so much bigger than that. So it says, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in and, in and through him we might become endued with, viewed as being in, and examples of, this is why the Amplified Bible, they say it's the woman's version of the Bible because there's so many words. <laughs> endued with, viewed as being in, and examples of the righteousness of God, what we ought to be approved and acceptable and in right relationship with him by his goodness. Let me sum that up in the New King James where it says, him who knew no sin, he, he was made to be sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay, Jesus was made to be sin so that you and I could be made righteous. Okay. I see you don't like that. Because, you know, I mean, let's be honest. Most religiously brainwashed Christians, they want to hold fast to, I'm just an old sinner. I'm not worth a whole lot. You know, God can't use me. You just believed a pile of manure. It's not true. It's not the gospel. It's not really even that exciting. You were a pile of manure before you got saved, and you're still a pile after? That is a pile, <laughs> It's, it's not true. It's not the gospel. It's not even good enough to get out of bed for. But when you tell me God made Jesus to be who I was in my spirit man and that he died as me and that when I put my faith in him, I not only get forgiven of my sins, but I get a brand new nature. By the way, a nature that has righteousness built into it. See, you should turn to your neighbor there and tell him now, if you're born again, say, I'm righteous. Somebody said, yeah, you're thinking about that. See, your mind's thinking about that. Your mind's thinking about that because you remember what you did yesterday. Well, I didn't do good yesterday. You not doing good, let me tell you what that is and how to set yourself free. You not doing good means this. You yielded to your lower nature. It never jeopardizes your righteousness in Christ as a born-again child of God. You just stepped out of your spirit, man, and got into your flesh, man, for a moment for some sort of gratification, and then you get back in, and then you get back over here, oh, God, I'm so sorry, like you're some miserable loser. No, you didn't get out of your spiritual place. You just yielded to your flesh. I'm saying you didn't give up your spiritual 
position in Christ. You are righteous before you made a mistake and you're righteous after you make a mistake. Why? Because your righteousness is not based on what you do. And let me tell you folks, that's good news. Somebody said, well you preach like that, people, they're gonna be sinning all over the place. They're already sinning all over the place. That message actually causes you to not want to live in that perpetually. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching. All right. All right, let me wrap it up here. Ephesians chapter 2. Reigning. I want to reign in life. I don't want to live in death and darkness. And defeat, that is not, those are not characteristics of born again children of God. We have this, listen to me, because you little, not, not you people, but maybe somebody online. You religious people that are thinking like, you have the same position that Christ has. The religiously brainwashed mind cannot, doesn't know what to do with that, so they push it away. You have the same position that Christ has now. How do you get there? Do you have to study? Do you have to go to Bible school? Do you have to have hands? All you gotta do is get born again because you become a new creature and the new creature happens to be Christ, your nature and his nature, just like he did with you. Your nature, he became your nature so that your nature could become his nature. I'm gonna say that again. His nature became your nature, your sin nature, so that your nature, sin nature, might become his righteous nature. Does anybody think that's good news? Okay, it's by grace. See, we're talking about grace and, uh, and righteousness. Ephesians 2, it's by free grace. Somebody say free grace. Say it again, free grace. It's by free grace, God's unmerited favor, but we know it means two more things, right? Grace just doesn't mean unmerited favor. It means God's divine dealings with the heart and God's ability. By God's grace, you're saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. The fullness of what he received in being raised from the dead. You became a partaker of that through your faith. What does that mean? That means you have to believe this. It's just not gonna happen because you heard it. You believe it and then you act on it. That's how we operate in God. We're so works-minded, we gotta work for everything. I gotta work to have the anointing. I mean, the most anoint, the strongest the anointings ever come upon me is when I just let God be God and stop working for it. I mean, I, you've heard my sob stories. I, I mean, we'd be on vacation with the family and I'd lock myself up there on the, on, the, on the beautiful house on the beach and I'm locking myself up in a dark room meditating on my meditation sheets. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to work so that the anointing doesn't leave me. You can't work for this. You gotta enter in. Did Abraham work for it? Nope, he just entered into it. Did Moses work for it? Nope, wasn't even born again. Just entered into it. Did David work for it? No, he just entered into God's goodness. That's grace. But most of the churches, they're always gotta work for something. You wanna know why that is? That's your flesh. Because you wanna get some credit for it or you wanna be a part of it. You wanna feel like you did something to have this in your life. It's called flesh and it's called works. And it doesn't mix with the gospel. He says this, Ephesians, I, said, I read it here. Christ's salvation through your faith, and this salvation is not of yourselves. It's not, is anybody looking at this? It's not of yourselves, of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, 
but it is the gift of God, not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands. Somebody say, I'm letting my past go. I'm talking about like yesterday past too. This morning past, the way some of y'all talk to one another on the way to church. You should be, let it go. Let it go. You just yield it to your lower nature, that's all. Just dust yourself up and say, I'm getting back in the spirit over here. I'm good here. I never, this was never jeopardized. That's a lie of the devil. Because he wants to trip you up so that you backslide and get out of God. He can't, he can't take what God gave you because you didn't do anything to get it. And I'm sorry, anybody, any pastor or minister that wants to challenge this, anytime I'll meet you behind the playground at 3 p.m. today. Because I ain't playing around anymore with the religiousness. This is the gospel. What's the difference between the gospel of work, I mean the, the, the salvation by works versus the gospel? If you're focused on yourself, then you're in works. If you're focused on him, you're in the gospel. That means when you miss it and you yield to your flesh, you say something ugly, you do something you shouldn't have done, you say, that was just my flesh. Thank you, Lord, that I have a, a, a promise from you that I'm in Christ. I've received something that I didn't work for and I'm not losing it just because I did something dumb in my flesh. That's religion. The devil will ride that wave till you are gone out of the plan of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's called condemnation. And he's a master of condemnation. But once you know this, you tell him to go to hell. Did I just say that? Did I say that out loud? Well, that's where he's going anyway, go to hell. Go to hell, devil. I'm glad we let the kids out. <laughs> they'd be saying that on the way home. Go to hell, devil. <laughs> and they'd be right. Just say it because it feels good. Go to hell, devil. <laughs> Go to hell, devil. We should write a song about that. Go to hell, devil. <laughs> uh, get an early head start. Because that's where you're going. It was the plan from the start to the same words. I never said I was a, a rapper. It's a gift. I died so that Christ could live in me. Somebody say this with me. Say, I'm in Christ. Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm in Christ. Hallelujah. I'm a, I'm a new creature. Glory to God. Come on, say, I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. And that means yesterday, too. Hallelujah. Say this with me. Say, I'm in Christ, and I'm righteous. You know, hold on. Do you know what that means? That means you're in a, a state right now in your spirit, if you're born again, that you've never sinned before. Somebody say, how can that be? I sinned yesterday. Well, that's your flesh. Spirit, you're connected to Christ. You're righteous. See, people, religious people, I know there's some people, you're, you're, you're theologians, you're, you're, your brains are spinning, but guess what? Paul had to get taken out of his body to get a hold of this. You don't get it with your intelligence. You gotta get it by revelation of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, right now, I am righteous in Christ. That means I can stand before God as if I have never sinned because in Christ, my new nature, I am sin free. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Is anybody here? Thank God for that. This is the gospel, folks. This is what turns nations upside down, the gospel. The religious stuff nobody cares about. But you start preaching the gospel, people start getting free. And somebody said it's the gospel of grace. No, my God, it's the gospel. The gospel is a message of grace. Somebody, because people, I'm done, I'm done talking. Religious people have to divide it. They have to differentiate between their 
gospel, which is a gospel of works. Well, you gotta be sanctified. Well, no, duh. But we do that from our position of already being made righteous. You're not trying to work yourself into a place of being made righteous. You're already there. The process of sanctification is learning how to now live a life of the Spirit in my connection, out of my connection with Christ. Well, you need to keep working at it, and you got to study, you got to, then you're going to be approved by God. Lies. I'm already approved by God in Christ. Thanks be to God, uh, Ephesians 2. I've already been accepted in the beloved. And I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in him. Is anybody here? How many would like to hear more messages like this? My God, somebody uh, years ago, they were telling me they went to a church and they said, they, I heard them saying something to uh, somebody that I was around. They said, my God, if I go to church one more time and hear that we're all sinners and we're going to hell, I'm never going back again. I mean, I get it. I get it. You're, you're unsaved. You need, you need something, but we don't need to be told we're going to hell every week. I got it on the first time. Most unsaved people, they know there's something wrong in here. I know something's off. They need to hear some good news. Like Jesus, like God actually had a plan that involved love. God involved a plan that he didn't need me to work in. God, God had a plan that he actually became a man himself and actually took care of the problem and then gave, gave it to me as, on a silver platter as a present. That's what I need to hear. Hello? Preaching sin. Brother Hagin said it. I'm the last thing I'm going to say. Brother Hagin preached it. I'm not preaching sin. I'm preaching the cure to sin. You want people to start living better and tell them the truth of the gospel and who they are. Don't tell them like you're nothing but a, a terrible sinner. We, we, I, we already know that. We need a nature change and we need some revelation. Amen. Glory to God.